Look at this map. All the ships in the world. Green for cargo, red for liquid. Okay, the liquid is mostly oil. That's a ship ton of boats. Whoa, these two almost crashed. And look around you. I'm sure almost everything you have was shipped on one of these dots. So since it's so important, you ought to know some tales from the sea. Here are seven mini videos you should know about shipping. Like one, we're building a new Panama Canal. Yep, that's right, a new canal beside old Panama right here in Nicaragua, blasting it through this path, cheating by going through Lake Nicaragua. Except no, I lied. We are not building this canal. That was some crazy American idea in the early 1900s when we were originally building an Atlantic Pacific Canal to bypass the whole continent down here. Mexico and Colombia also lost their bids for the canal. Panama section was only really chosen because the French had already tried to dig a canal there but failed and gave away the half dug land for cheap. But still, the Americans had kind of promised they would build Nicaragua their own canal too. And by they would build, I mean they would import laborers and work them to death. Until the stock market crashed in 1929 and then they said screw that and stuck to Panama. Until now. The Panama Canal is fine for the modern day, but there are three main problems. A, it's too small. Fitting big tankers through it is like parking a Big Mac truck right in a little garage. Just won't work for our bigger and bigger ships. B, it's too crowded. It can take up to 10 hours to get through this canal, not even including the wait time. But hey, nothing worse than New York traffic, am I right fellow car lovers? And C, it's too American. It was built by the US, owned by the US until 1977, and the US will make sure the Panamese government is always on their side. They will make sure of it. So in 2013, it was announced by a Chinese billionaire, Wang Jing, they'll pay for it with their new company, HKND. He pinky promised that the Chinese government had no involvement in the canal, but I don't know. With an estimated $50 billion price tag, four times Nicaragua's GDP, it was not a cheap investment to be made by this one random billionaire, but not unheard of. And just like how Panama will never be anti-USA, China would make sure Nicaragua would never be anti-China. Which is funny considering Nicaragua is one of the only countries on earth to recognize Taiwan as the true glorious China until 2021 when they switched their Chinas. Anyways, Wang never had to do business with a country that doesn't even recognize his homeland because he lost 85% of his wealth in a 2015 Chinese stock market crash. Plus in 2016, the US just expanded the Panama Canal to meet demand instead of blasting a whole new canal for the Americas. So if there'll be any new American canal, it'll probably just be made in Panama. Two. The Suez Crisis. Speaking of canals, I know one in crisis. Let's kick it to Egypt. Sitting between the Med and Red Seas, it was the perfect place for a canal to be built. But there's a problem. A crisis, one might say. A Suez Crisis. See, in 1956, the Egyptian president, Gamal Nasser, decided to nationalize the Suez Canal, taking away from the British who controlled it and the French who built it. This caused Israel to invade the Sinai Peninsula, starting a war which closed the canal. Wait, this is the wrong crisis. I'm so sorry about that. What I meant to say was that in 1967, Egypt and Israel fought a war over the Sinai Peninsula again, but they were beaten by Israel back to the Suez in four days. They were in a pretty bad mood about it, so their president resigned and they closed the canal for eight years until 1975. Are you serious? That's not the right Suez crisis? Who's writing these videos? I'm so sorry again. I meant to say that in 2021, a big boat blocked the canal because it was too windy outside. There are two lessons here. One, our boats might be too big for our puny canals. I mean, this Ever Given is a 400 meter long ship. That's a track length. Go run around a track and tell me that that's a small boat. Tell me straight to my face, it's not. So if the boats keep getting bigger and bigger, we'll have to make new canals like the new Suez Canal or start driving around Africa again. And the second lesson, for such a globally important area on Earth, the Suez seems to shut down way more than we would like it to. 10% of all trade goes through this tiny canal. The one ship getting stuck for six days caused around $60 billion to be lost. This one economist, James Firer, found that every 10% decrease in distance on the sea makes trade increase by 5%, and that every dollar trade increases, income will increase by $0.25. So relying on this tiny, politically unstable canal to stay open, it's gonna make everyone a whole lot more vulnerable to whatever bullshit is going on in Egypt. Three, so just go over. 
And what's faster than just going over your problems, like physically, on Earth? What I mean is, what if we could avoid all these land masses, all these political squabbles, and all these crazy canals? Go over the planet, through the Arctic. Wait, isn't the Arctic full of ice? Yeah, but ice is just water you haven't met yet. Plus, we have satellite images showing that the ice is receding. Kind of like your hairline. And for probably 95% of you, it's probably gonna suck. Coasts are rising and water patterns are changing. But hey, for the rare Greenlandic or none of any businessman in the audience, boy do I have an opportunity for you. Open up your own shipping lane. We got the first to melt the Russian route going along the coast of Siberia, cutting the Suez Lane from Europe to Asia in half. Only downside is European Russian business is not exactly in right now. Then we have the legendary Northwest Passage in Canada, cutting the Panama route from Europe to Asia in half too. In fact, in 2007 was the first time when a ship carried cargo through the passage, and in 2014 was the first time a ship did it without an escort. Uh, escort by an icebreaker. The transpolar route going through the North Pole by Greenland and Norwegian Svalbard, well, that's still probably going to be too icy for a long time, so to the Svalbardi traders in the audience, better start emitting some more carbon. <coughs> the Arctic could be a great solution to the big boat, small canal problem we've been facing. It just means you'll have to see more sad videos of polar bears falling off the ice for a couple of decades. But as of right now, they're only open for a couple weeks in summer. And they won't even be open for two months a year until around 20 40. Plus you have the whole problem of nobody living here, you know, no ports along the way to drop off and pick up other goods, and you know how these logistics companies love their efficiency. So for now, expect the only goods seriously shipped through the Arctic to be raw materials, basically just bulk loads of metal, rocks, and oil. Currently it's too expensive, dangerous, and frankly cold to really ship through it. But hey, maybe in the 2100s it'll be a bumping trade route and we'll have to worry about Greenlandic pirates raiding the North Pole trade. Or, why don't the Americans use their river? Back to the map. You'll see of course these boats cover the entire ocean. After all, boats float on water, not land, right? Right? But look at China, and Argentina, and Brazil, and Europe. There are so many ships in land, or on rivers as the fancy people say. But these aren't even the largest rivers on earth. This is, wait no I meant this is, oops I meant to say the largest navigable waterway on earth. That's here, in the United States of America. And if you watch any video on this channel, he'll probably say something like, the Mississippi Basin has more navigable waterways than the rest of the world combined. I can't find anything that says that, but it's definitely the largest on earth. It even connects to the Great Lakes and St. Laurent rivers through some canals. Even here, the water is connected to the Mississippi Basin. So when we zoom in, why aren't there any boats on the American side when there are clearly ships on the Canadian side? The first answer is, there are ships here. They're below Baton Rouge where this bridge stops them from passing. But that seems like an easy fix. Either use that American spirit and rebuild the bridge, or just wait for one of these Louisiana hurricanes to come and destroy it. The second answer is because of this old guy, Wesley Jones, who was a US Senator over 100 years ago. In 1920, he introduced the Jones Act, or the... Yeah. The gist of the bill, no cargo will flow from two American ports unless it's on a US built boat owned by Americans and has an American crew operating it. Yes, including Hawaii and other distant islands, and yes, most American ships do not fit this criteria. Wesley did this mainly to give his state, Washington, a shipping monopoly to the latest hip spot Alaska. You wouldn't want these insane Canadians shipping there for you, would you? But look at what it's done to the USA. All the boats in the Mississippi, US, US, US. In the St. Laurent, Netherlands, Liberia, Marshall Islands. Doesn't take a genius to tell you which side has more trade with this policy in place. This bill effectively bans the cheapest and most environmentally friendly way to ship in the modern day in favor of 1920s protectionism. I mean, one kilometer of barges is about the equivalent of 140 kilometers of semi-trucks. You tell me which seems more efficient. But hey, it might be over soon. For the first time in over 100 years, Joe Biden let a non-US ship go from US port to US port to give fuel to Puerto Rico after a hurricane in 2022. So you never know. Maybe we'll see a Mississippi full of green and red dots in a couple of decades after we refresh the map. Five. Why does everybody care about Djibouti? 
Let's go to the other side of the country power spectrum and look at tiny Djibouti. If you don't know where that is, huh? I don't blame you. It's a poor and tiny African country sitting here. But everybody loves Djibouti. Look at how many ships are sitting outside of it. And by everybody loves them, I mean everyone has a military base here. The US, UK, France, Italy, Spain, Germany, China, Japan, Saudi Arabia, and also India and Russia have looked into it. Why does a poor, tiny country need nine foreign military bases? Because the Mandem is here at the Bab el Mandeb. Let's look around it. Up here is the Suez Canal, and as we've said before, 10% of all trade goes through here and obviously has to go through the Bab down here as well. It's close to the Persian Gulf, a place you're familiar with if you've ever turned on your lights. And it's close to Somalia, which had a bit of a pirate issue recently. Doesn't help that this is a poor and corrupt nation with a president who's been leader since the 90s, and boy does he ever love accepting more and more military bases to line his pockets with rent money. A true land chad. So it's a great location for a base. Way easier to manipulate than Egypt is, that's for sure. Why don't you apply for a base there? They're not gonna deny you, you know, because of the implication. Six. The most important trade route on earth. If there's two things American presidents love, it's golf and the golf. Why do they love it so much? Well, it's a game you don't really have to spend that much effort in and can still work while getting some leisure time in. Oh, and they love this golf because it has a sh ton of oil. About two thirds of the planet's oil, at least of all proven reserves. It also has about one third of the world's natural gas and about one half of the world's petty squabbles. Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf, Sunni versus Shia, and who gets to influence these tiny states? There's a lot of instability in the Gulf, which sucks because literally one half of all traded oil on Earth comes out of this tiny corridor called the Strait of Hormuz. Going back to our map, there's a whole lot of red in the Arabian Gulf. Going where? Well, let's trace it. Escaping the Persian Gulf past Iran, it bends around India, having to deal with them and their Pakistan issues, then past Sri Lanka, going through the Strait of Malacca, giving Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia a bite of the power, then through this sea with no political issues at all and everyone is happy to share, past Taiwan to China or East Asia in general. Most energy in East Asia is imported from the Gulf, which is why I say that this line is the most important trade route on Earth, maybe ever in human history. Yes, even more important than you. No, I'm sorry. No, it's my fault. I didn't mean to. Ugh. Middle Eastern energy is what keeps the East Asian powerhouses alive, the region that makes your iPhones, Nintendo, and all-knowing data spies. And it's a huge reason why. Seven. China needs this ocean. You might have heard about China claiming the entire South China Sea and thought, that's weird, why can't they just share this water and be best friends with their buddies? China doesn't want friends though, it wants money and power. The South China Sea is one of the most contested areas on earth right now. Everyone is claiming their parts of the sea like it's the hottest new craze and as an early trendsetter China gets to claim the entire ocean as theirs because without it they wouldn't have a safe access to this energy pipeline they are oh so worried about or at least have safe access after Singapore. They uh still gotta worry a little bit before that. Without imported hydrocarbons, they basically have no energy, no non-coal energy at least. They can't possibly power 1.5 billion people's Genshin impact with the very, very limited supply of fuel and materials found here. And don't even think about renewable energy either. Look at the sky here. Without energy, they can't industrialize. Without factories, they can't export. And that's like their whole thing, man. You know, made in China, flooding the world with a bunch of cheaply made products. That's what turned them from one of the poorest countries on earth to one of the richest. And without this success, without constant building and constant exporting, the people will be what we call unemployed and the nation won't be able to finance itself. Now I'm not saying China would collapse if everyone's unemployed, but I am saying a lot of people would be unemployed if they were somehow cut off from this trade route. So they're dumping sand in the South China Sea, sticking a flag on it, and calling it part of the Middle Kingdom. Oh the crazy things we do to keep our boats safe and our goods shipped.